This is the Music Halls of Fame podcast. This week, we honor the year in music for 1995, along with a member of the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame class of 1995. We also look at the case for putting the Smashing Pumpkins into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. Plus, our Spotlight Hall of Fame isn't a hall per se. It's the Library of Congress National Recording Registry in Washington, D.C. Before we get going with the podcast, like everyone tells you, please like, subscribe, and hit the notification bell so you'll know when these podcast episodes drop, which is usually every Thursday. Now, on to this week's episode. The year was 1995. In music, the Beatles Anthology TV documentary aired, along with the premiere of their first song in over 20 years called Free as a Bird. The TV music show Live from the House of Blues premiered. Tommy Lee from Motley Crue married actress Pamela Anderson, beginning one of the most famous celebrity marriages of the 1990s. Michael Jackson released what became the biggest selling double album of all time worldwide, History. After Green Day and The Offspring released their albums in 1994, Rancid released their 1995 album Out Come the Wolves, which further helped to propel the rebirth of punk rock for a new generation. Garbage released their debut album, as did The Coors and The Foo Fighters. Radiohead released their album The Bends. Britpop was raised to a whole other level with albums by Pulp and Oasis. Celine Dion released the biggest-selling French album, De. DC Talk released the influential Christian album, Jesus Freak. Perry Farrell of Jane's Addiction was arrested for drug possession, as was Scott Wheland of the Stone Temple Pilots and Stephen Adler of Guns N' Roses. Tupac started his jail sentence for sexual assault, but got out by the end of the year thanks to a deal with notorious record label owner Suge Knight. Bill Berry of R.E.M. suffered a brain aneurysm while performing on stage. He would eventually recover. Also, a man tried to kill Jimmy Page while he was performing on stage in Michigan. Security got to the man before he could reach Jimmy. Alanis Morissette's Jagged Little Pill was the biggest selling album of 1995. Other big albums released that year included Mariah Carey's Daydream, Queen's Made in Heaven, Shania Twain's The Woman in Me, No Doubt's Tragic Kingdom, Jewel's Pieces of You, The Waiting to Exhale soundtrack, Bruce Springsteen's Greatest Hits, Radiohead's The Bends, Oasis's What's the Story, Morning Glory, Tupac's Me Against the World, Bjork's Post, and The Smashing Pumpkins' Melancholy and the Infinite Sadness. Julio's Gangsta's Paradise was the best-selling song of that year. That was from the movie Dangerous Minds, starring Michelle Pfeiffer, by the way. Other big songs for the year included TLC's Waterfalls, along with their other hit, Creep, Seal's Kiss from a Rose, which was for the Batman Forever soundtrack, if memory serves, Boys to Men's On Bended Knee, Real McCoy's Another Night, Mariah Carey's Fantasy, Madonna's Take a Bow, Monica's Don't Take It Personal, Montel Jordan's This Is How We Do It, and Oasis's Wonderwall. Other popular songs that year included Michael and Janet Jackson's duet, Scream, Adina Howard's Freak Like Me, Shaggy's Bombastic, LL Cool J, and Boys to Men's Hey Lover, Brian Adams' Have You Ever Really Loved a Woman from the Don Juan DeMarco soundtrack, if memory serves, starring Marlon Brando and Johnny Depp. Good memory. Take That Back for Good and Mariah Carey with Boys to Men and their song, One Sweet Day. In country music, the Great American Country Video Music Channel launched in 1995. The top country albums were Tim McGraw's All I Wanted, Garth Brooks' Fresh Horses, Alan Jackson's Greatest Hits Collection, John Michael Montgomery's self-titled album, Reba McIntyre's Starting Over, Shania Twain's The Woman in Me, Jeff Foxworthy's comedy album Games Rednecks Play, Alison Krause's And Now That I've Found You, a collection, Travis Tritt's Greatest Hits, From the Beginning, and Vince Gill's Souvenir. 
The biggest country singles included Tim McGraw's I Like It, I Love It, and Want Some More of It. Catchy tune. Also, his hit Not a Moment Too Soon to go along with George Strait's Check Yes or No, David Lee Murphy's A Dust on the Bottle, Alan Jackson's Gone Country, and also his other big hit, I Don't Even Know Your Name, John Michael Montgomery sold, and also his hit, I Can Love You Like That, which was also done as an R&B song by the group All for One during that time period as well. Lori Morgan also had a big hit with I Didn't Know My Own Strength. Brooks and Dunn had Little Miss Honky Tonk. Pam Tillis had Mi Vida Loca. Colin Ray had My Kind of Girl, and to finish it off, Jeff Carson had his song, Not On Your Love. In hip-hop, the big albums were Bone Thugs and Harmony's E-1999 Eternal, Dog Food by The Dog Pound, Me Against the World by Tupac, Cypress Hill's Cypress Hill 3, Temple of Boom, Raekwon's Only Built for Cuban Links, the Friday movie soundtrack was out that year, Cocktails by Too Short, 8 Ball and MJG's On Top of the World, Old Dirty Bastards Return to the 36 Chambers, the Dirty Version, and LL Cool J's huge hit, Mr. Smith. Singles-wise, Coolio dominated the year with Gangster's Paradise. Notorious B.I.G. had the songs One More Chance and Big Papa. LL Cool J had Hey Lover with Boys to Men. Looney's had I Got Five on it. Tupac had Dear Mama. Dr. Dre had Keep Their Heads Ringing. Method Man and Red Man had How High. Junior Mafia had Players Anthem. And DeBrat had Give It To You. In dance music, the usual batch of pop dance and R&B crossover artists made the dance charts like TLC, Madonna, and Michael Jackson. Hip-hop was also huge on the dance charts like Notorious B.I.G., Funkmaster Flex, Junior Mafia, Naughty by Nature, and Method Man. However, there were some more quote-unquote legit dance artists on the charts, though it was mainly Euro dance artists like London Beat, 20 Fingers, 2 Unlimited, Black Box, Corona, Real McCoy, M People, Jamiroquai, Crystal Waters, Living Joy, and La Bouche. Music Magazine started in 1995. The Chemical Brothers debuted with their album Exit Planet Dust. Bjork released Post. Her one-time boyfriend, Goldie, released Timeless. Left Field released Leftism, and classic tracks from that year included Underworld's Born Slippy, The Buckethead's The Bomb, These Thoughts Fall Into My Mind, and Todd Terry's iconic 1995 remix of Everything But The Girl's 1994 ballad, Missing, which catapulted up both the dance and pop music charts. Even though DJ Magazine didn't start their official Top 100 DJs list until 1997, their staff voted Judge Jules the top DJ in 1995. In Latin music, the year was sadly about the loss of Tejano star Selena, who had six of the top ten Latin albums after her murder and four of the top singles. Other Latin artists who had big albums and singles included the Gypsy Kings, Luis Miguel, Gloria Estefan, Bronco, Marco Antonio Solis, E. Los Bucas, Pedro Fernandez, and La Lana. In theater, Victor Victoria opened on Broadway, and there were also Broadway revivals of Hello, Dolly! and How to Succeed in Business Without Really Trying, while the musical Dracula opened in Prague, which sort of makes sense when you think about it. Bring in the Noise, Bring in the Funk opened off Broadway in 1995 and then opened on Broadway in 1996. Musical films in 1995 included the animated Arabian Night and Pocahontas, along with Bye Bye Birdie, Empire Records, and the show. Groups that formed in 1995 included the Black Eyed Peas, the Bacon Brothers, Buck Cherry, Capone and Noriega, Damage, Fountains of Wayne, Hoover Phonic, Godsmack, Stained, Kevin Eubanks and the Tonight Show Band, Evanescence, Groove Theory, Keen, LFO, 
Lifehouse, InSync, Propeller Heads, Morchiba, and Tegan and Sarah. Alan Wilder left Depeche Mode. Paul D'Amour left Tool. Singer Robbie Williams left the boy band Take That. And Girls, now probably your aunt's parents and older relatives, lost their ever-loving minds when that happened. Crisis hotlines were literally set up. I am not joking about that. They were literally set up to handle all the girls, now women, who got crazy about the fact that Take That was breaking up. My goodness. Bands that either broke up until, of course, their inevitable reunions, including Take That, who inevitably did reunite, or announced their hiatus included... Oingo Boingo, Two in a Room, Aztec Camera, Black Sheep, General Public, Pink Floyd, Bronsky Beat, The Jerry Garcia Band, The Cult, Accept, Skinny Puppy, Kid and Play, Diggable Planets, Living Color, The Lynch Mob, Suicidal Tendencies, Sunny Day Real Estate, and The Soup Dragons. Bands that got back together in 1995 included Journey, The Misfits, and Bruce Springsteen and the E Street Band, who did a reunion tour in 1995, but officially got back together again in 1999. Artists who were born in 1995 included singer and composer Poppy, V. Ann Jimin of BTS, Megan Thee Stallion, Doja Cat, Melanie Martinez, Tae Young and Yuta Nakamoto of NCT, Lil Uzi Vert, Dua Lipa, Givian, Ross Lynch of R5, Post Malone, Queen Nyjah, Troy Savan, Yisoo Kim of Blackpink, A Boogie with the Hoodie, Michael Clifford of 10 Seconds of Summer, Kehlani, and rapper Joey Badass. Lead singer Shannon Hoon of the alternative band Blind Melon passed away from a drug overdose. Tejano singer Selena was shot and killed by her fan club president. Grateful Dead lead singer Jerry Garcia passed away in 1995, and other musical artists who passed away that year included Melvin Franklin of The Temptations, Rory Gallagher, rapper Easy e of N.W.A., Bobby DeBarge of the group Switch, Ronnie White of The Miracles, Dwayne Gotell of Skinny Puppy, Sterling Morrison of the Velvet Underground, jazz trumpet player Don Cherry, Jerry Daniels of the Ink Spots, Matthew Ashman of Adam and the Ants, and also the group Bow Wow Wow, entertainer Dean Martin, Motown artist Junior Walker, Jimmy McShane of Baltimore, Roland Wolf of Nick Cave and the Bad Seeds, singer and actor Burl Ives, dancer and singer Ginger Rogers, singer Teresa Tang, Singer Charlie Rich, singer Phyllis Hyman, singer Lola Flores, jazz drummer Art Taylor, David Cole of CNC Music Factory, blues singer Ted Hawkins, Bob Stinson of The Replacements, disc jockey Wolfman Jack, singer Alan McCarthy of Men Without Hats, Darren Robinson, a.k.a. The Human Beatbox from the group The Fat Boys, Yardbirds manager Peter Grant, Ingo Switchtenberg of Halloween, and singer Nike Ardia. Philip Taylor Kramer of Iron Butterfly went missing in 1995, but his remains weren't found until 1999. Richie Edwards of the Manic Street Preachers went missing in 1995, and he has not been seen since. In award ceremonies that were held for the music of 1995, Alanis Morissette's Jagged Little Pill won Album of the Year at the Grammy Awards. Also at the Grammys, Seal's Kiss from a Rose won Record and Song of the Year, while Hootie and the Blowfish won Best New Artist. At the MTV Video Music Awards, TLC won Video of the Year for Waterfalls. TLC also won Artist of the Year at the Billboard Music Awards. Mary J. Blige, TLC, D'Angelo, and Notorious B.I.G. were the big winners at the Soul Train Music Awards. Garth Brooks was Artist of the Year at the American Music Awards. Reba McIntyre, Garth Brooks, and Hootie and the Blowfish were the music category winners at the People's Choice Awards in 1995. At the Eurovision Singing Contest, which was held that year in Dublin, Ireland, Secret Garden from the country of Norway won for the song Nocturne. Alan Jackson won Entertainer of the Year at the Country Music Association Awards, while Brooks and Dunn won Entertainer of the Year at the Academy of Country Music Awards. 
Oasis won Best British Album for their iconic album, What's the Story, Morning Glory, and Take That won Best Song for Back for Good at the Brit Awards. Alanis Morissette won Album of the Year for Jagged Little Pill and Song of the Year for You Oughta Know, while Shania Twain won Entertainer of the Year at the Juno Awards. Tina Arena won Album of the Year for Don't Ask and Song of the Year for Chains at the Aria Music Awards. At the Tony Awards, Sunset Boulevard won Best Musical and Showboat won Best Revival of a Musical. The Pulitzer Prize for Music went to Morton Gould for String Music, which actually premiered in 1994 but somehow managed to qualify for 1995. Musically at the Academy Awards, Il Postino won Best Film Score and Alan Menken won Best Song for Colors of the Wind from Disney's Pocahontas. Portishead's album Dummy won the Mercury Music Prize in 1995. The Rock and Roll Hall of Fame opened its physical museum in Cleveland, Ohio in 1995. That year's ceremony was held on January 12th at the Waldorf Astoria Hotel in New York City. After years of having very few video cameras recording the event, MTV recorded it for an edited showing on its network the week after the ceremony. At the induction ceremony, music journalist Paul Ackerman was inducted into the non-performers category. The Orioles were inducted into the early influencers category. And in the performers category, the hall inducted the Allman Brothers Band, Frank Zappa, Led Zeppelin, Martha Ann the Vandellas, Janis Joplin, Neil Young, and this next artist. There once was a time when the Reverend Al Green was simply known as Al Green. He was born Albert Leornis Green, with an E at the end of his name, on April 13, 1946, in Forest City, Arkansas, and started out singing in his group, the Green Brothers, which included his sister while he was in high school. He was kicked out of his house and had to fend for himself when his extremely religious father caught him listening to secular music, specifically his idol, Jackie Wilson. While still in high school, Al moved to Memphis, Tennessee, and eventually went to live with a prostitute. Al also started another group called Al Green and the Creations, and it was through that group that he was noticed by Memphis record producer Willie Mitchell, who signed him to a recording contract with High Records, and he dropped the letter E at the end of his name and began spelling it like the color green. Al found early success with his debut single in 1967, Backup Train, which went to number five on the American R&B singles charts. And from there, Al went on a roll, including six straight number one albums on the American R&B charts. He also had now classic hits from the late 1960s to the mid-1970s, such as Let's Stay Together, Tired of Being Alone, Love and Happiness, Look What You've Done For Me, You Ought to Be With Me, Call Me, a lot of me's in his singles, by the way, Here I Am, Living For You, Let's Get Married, Sha La La, L-O-V-E, Full of Fire, Take Me to the River, and I'm Still in Love With You. Lots of I's, me's, and you's. By the mid-1970s, Al Green was looked at as the next version of Sam Cooke and Jackie Wilson. He had the vocal style, and he also had the sex appeal, and he, like Sam and Jackie, developed a following, especially with his stage shows. There was a sexual attraction with the ladies that absolutely drove them wild, and that is pretty much where his troubles all started. Now, if you are yourself born again or change religions for whatever reason, it may have been a traumatic event that may have pushed you to convert. You probably did not have an event quite like what happened to Al, though. And this event ended up stopping his career completely in its tracks. You see, there was a lady by the name of Mary Woodson White. She, like most women of the era, fell in love with Al. The problem was that she was married and also she had kids, and apparently that did not stop her from going after Al. One day, she left her husband and kids in New Jersey and drove to Al's show in upstate New York. Somehow, some way, she met Al, one thing led to another, and they became lovers because, you know, groupies, 
music, you know how it goes. Somewhere along the line, she either became an ex-girlfriend of his or a side piece or whatever, depending on whose version of the story you're going with, I guess. Be that as it may, on the night of October 18th, 1974, when Al got back to his house in Memphis, Tennessee, after flying all night from a concert in San Francisco, Mary was there waiting for him. Here is where this story goes completely off the rails. Only two people really know what went down, but here is the gist of the events that evening that have been pieced together. Something, don't know what, but something prompted Mary to snap. The rumor is that Mary wanted Al to marry her, even though she was still married. Anyway, Al, for whatever reason, went to take a bath. Long trip, I guess. Sometime during that bath, Mary came into the bathroom with a pot of hot grits. Again, not sure if the grits were made by her or by him before he went to take a bath. Then she poured the boiling hot water onto Al, leaving him with severe burns. Mary then went to Al's bedroom where she found his gun. Again, not sure if she knew that he had a gun. She took the 38 caliber pistol, pointed it at herself, and killed herself with it. According to some reports, Mary left a note in her purse detailing what she would do, so I guess this wasn't exactly a spur-of-the-moment type of suicide type thing. Once Al recovered from his burns, he decided that the event was a sign from God that he had strayed way too far down the path of sin and he needed to get himself back on the right track. He had technically been born again a year earlier, but I guess in name only. Now, he decided to fully commit. At the height of his soul singing career, Al Green quit singing soul music and started doing gospel music. Not only that, but he also decided to become a preacher. He became an ordained minister back in 1976. Talk about totally committing to the whole born again part. He eventually went back to performing secular soul music, but he still preaches to this very day. And now you know what prompted Al Green to become the Reverend Al Green. I should also mention that even after his religious conversion, he was accused by his ex-wife Shirley, who married him after he became a minister, of repeated physical and emotional abuse, including hitting her with a boot after she refused to have sex with him because she was five months pregnant at the time with their child. He admitted to the spousal abuse while under oath during their divorce filing in 1982. Al Green put out 29 secular and gospel albums combined, and 25 compilation albums. He was nominated for 21 Grammy Awards and won 11 of them, including eight soul gospel performance Grammys in the 1980s. His songs Take Me to the River and Let's Stay Together were inducted into the Grammy Hall of Fame. He is number 65 on Rolling Stone Magazine's Greatest Artists of All Times list. His songs have been covered numerous times, most famously by Tina Turner with Let's Stay Together, The Talking Heads would Take Me to the River, and UB40 with Here I Am. He is a member of the Gospel Music Hall of Fame, the Songwriters Hall of Fame, and also the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. Presented for induction by singer Natalie Cole, the Reverend Al Green, inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame in 1995, and we have put a selection of his greatest hits onto this week's podcast music playlist, the link to which is in the show notes. Before we go any further, we'd like to tell you that there is now a Music History In-Depth podcast where we go more in-depth on a few of the events that happened in music history for that particular week. The Music History In-Depth podcast drops every Tuesday on YouTube or wherever you get your podcast from, as does our Music History Today podcast, which goes over the daily events in music history. The Music History Today podcast drops daily, including weekends, on YouTube or wherever you get your podcasts. Now, back to this podcast. Music 
This week, we are going to make the case for putting the Chicago, Illinois group, the Smashing Pumpkins, into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. As we always do, to the tail of the tape we go. Since they burst onto the scene in 1991, the Smashing Pumpkins have released 12 studio albums, 4 live albums, and 7 compilation albums. Of those, 6 hit the top 10, with 1995's Melancholy and the Infinite Sadness hitting number 1. On the singles chart, they had 55 of them. Of those, 14 hit the top 10, with 1996's song 1979 hitting number 1. They were also well known for their music videos, especially the video for the 1996 song Tonight Tonight, which won six awards at the MTV Video Music Awards, including that year's Video of the Year. The Smashing Pumpkins were different from their 90s alt counterparts in that they didn't come from punk rock roots. Their music, with a few exceptions, was always more melodic than, say, Soundgarden or Nirvana or any group from the Seattle area. Guitarist and lead singer Billy Corgan was the driving force of the group, writing most of the gut-wrenching, nightmare-inducing lyrics. He did fit the grunge era from the aspect of writing some pretty depressing but cool lyrics. As far as influence goes, well... You don't have Panic at the Disco, Fall Out Boy, or My Chemical Romance without them. Depending on how you feel about those groups, that's either a good or a bad thing. For me, pretty good. Half and half, I'd say. Even though the Smashing Pumpkins have been eligible for the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame since 2016, the chances of them getting into the hall in the next few years are probably not great. For starters, the Hall's not done putting in every single 60s band they can find, apparently. There is also a backlog of bands that are already eligible, like Beck, Soundgarden, Alice in Chains, etc., who still haven't gotten in. Still, they at least deserve consideration, and hopefully, the Hall will eventually see fit to put the Smashing Pumpkins into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, because they do definitely do deserve it, especially when you consider the groups that are getting in nowadays. Just to prove our point, by the way, we have put their Greatest Hits album onto this week's podcast playlist to go with the Al Green Greatest Hits albums. And like I said before, the link to all of that is in the show notes. Each week in this spot, we highlight a different musical Hall of Fame or museum because there's a bunch more than just the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. There's the Country Music Hall of Fame, the Blues Hall, the Grammy Museum, among many, many others. This time, though, we're not going to talk about one that is a hall per se. However, to me, it's probably the most important. The Library of Congress, aside from being a place in the movie All the President's Men, is the nation's library. Established in April of 1800, it has more than 38 million books, 14 million photographs, 70 million manuscripts, and 5.5 million maps. From a musical standpoint, it's important for a couple of reasons. The first is that it has over 8 million pieces of sheet music and over 3.5 million recordings. The second, and probably the more important reason, is what it does with certain recordings. Since the passage of the National Recording Preservation Act of 2000, the library has developed a registry to preserve and protect certain pieces of music and other recordings that are considered historically relevant. That's a pretty high honor, knowing that your song or album is so important to the nation that it needs to be preserved forever. That's a pretty high-class list that you're going to be joining here. Some of these recordings are actually speeches or radio shows from yesteryear. For instance, the earliest recorded version of Abbott and Costello's Who's On First comedy sketch, a classic. Orson Welles' original War of the World radio broadcast and Dr. Martin Luther King's I Have a Dream speech are all in the registry as are the first recordings on cylinders that Thomas Edison used to show off the phonograph at an exhibition. The first official class was in 2002. 
There were 50 recordings that were declared important that year, and all of the above-mentioned recordings were in that first class. Annie Lennox was born on Christmas Day in 1954 in Aberdeen, Scotland. Dave Stewart was born on September 9, 1952 in Sunderland, England. They met in 1975 in London when Dave walked into a restaurant that Annie was working in at the time. In 1976, they were in a punk band together called The Catch, which became The Tourists. After a few years of band tensions, management legal issues, and record label conflicts, Lennox and Stewart decided to leave the group. They wanted to stop doing punk music and explored doing pop music, along with experimenting with electronica and other types of music. They were also dating while in the band, but decided to break up and keep it strictly professional at that point. In 1980, Lennox and Stewart formed the duo The Eurythmics, which is a type of exercise system that Annie saw when she was a kid. They were signed to RCA Records and put out their first album, In the Garden, in 1981, which went absolutely nowhere. They then went and built their own home studio in the Chalk Farm neighborhood in London and tried to manage everything themselves, which literally almost killed them, putting Stuart in the hospital with a collapsed lung and Lennox with a nervous breakdown. They then finished up their album in a small room in church studios in London. The result of all that stress was their second album, Sweet Dreams Are Made of This, which was released on January 4th, 1983. There were four songs that were officially released from that album. This Is The House was released on April 2nd, 1982. The Walk was released on June 18th of that year. And Love Is A Stranger, which became a big hit after its re-release, was originally released on November 8th of 1982. The fourth track released from the album is the one that the Library of Congress inducted into the National Recording Registry. The title track, Sweet Dreams Are Made Of This, was created during those Chalktown home studio sessions and, much like the rest of the album, was finished up at church studios and was produced by Dave, with both Annie and Dave writing the song. The story goes that one day Annie overheard Dave working on the idea for the song on a synthesizer. Annie got out another synthesizer and started playing along, and the song just kind of came together organically. As for the lyrics... They were written after a fight that Dave and Annie had and are actually about the breakup of their old band, The Tourists, and the state of their partnership and whether their dreams of being successful were going to come true. Uh, Spoiler alert, they did, and in a huge way. As it is, the lyrics are pretty simple, ten lines in total. Sweet dreams are made of this. Who am I to disagree? I travel the world in the seven seas. Everybody's looking for something. Some of them want to use you. Some of them want to get used by you. Some of them want to abuse you. And some of them want to be abused. The last two lines, hold your head up and keep your head up, with the phrase moving on, answering each chant, were added to keep the song from being utterly depressing. Also, Annie has said in interviews that people still come up to her and think that she's singing sweet dreams are made of cheese. Not sweet dreams are made of this. I'm not quite sure how they get the cheese part. You can't help everybody. What can I tell you? Sweet Dreams, the song, was made mainly by equipment that Dave and Annie got with a 5,000 British pound loan from the bank. That works out to around 25,000 U.S. dollars in today's money. The drums were done by the MCS drum computer. The Roland SH-101 synthesizer did the bass line. The strings were done on a borrowed Oberheim OBX. They only used one standard issue microphone for Annie's lyrics. When they brought the song to RCA Records, well, RCA hated it and said that it wouldn't be released because the song didn't have a chorus. It actually does, sort of, but what do record labels know? What got the song going in America was when a DJ in Cleveland, Ohio, started playing the song off the album itself, and it became popular in the Cleveland area. And after that, 
RCA had no choice but to release it in America. Sweet Dreams was released in Great Britain in January of 1983 and then made its way to America for an official release in May of 1983. Both the single and the album versions clock in at 3 minutes 36 seconds with a 12-inch version clocking in at 4 minutes 48 seconds. The single had their song, I Could Give You a Mirror, as its B-side. What turned the song into a generational hit was MTV, which was gaining super popularity at that point. The video was filmed just before the single and the album release in the UK. The boardroom scene was filmed in a West London studio. Other scenes were filmed in a London basement and in a field. The cow in the music video was inspired by surrealist artists like Salvador Dali, according to Dave. Plus, why not have a wandering cow in your video anyway? Also making a video cameo was Dave's drum computer that he wrote the song on. In the video, Annie Lennox showed off an androgynous orange crew cut hairstyle while she dressed in a black business suit. At that point, the British invasion was in full swing because of the power of MTV. And while androgyny had already been around for over a decade since Glam Rock and David Bowie with Ziggy Stardust, both Annie and also Boy George of the British band Culture Club, who also had gotten hot around that time, brought androgyny back to the mainstream. The music video took the song to the top 10 along with the album and turned the Eurythmics into MTV superstars. In fact, with each following video, Annie had a different persona. You never knew what you were going to get with her. At the 1984 Grammy Awards, while performing Sweet Dreams, Annie dressed up as Elvis Presley, complete with sideburns. The celebrity audience just sat there in stunned silence, not sure what they were witnessing. It was the 80s, after all. They weren't quite used to it yet. Sweet Dreams went to number two in Great Britain, only to be blocked by Bonnie Tyler's iconic smash hit, Total Eclipse of the Heart, for the top spot. In America, it took about four months, but in September of 1983, Sweet Dreams finally hit number one on the pop singles chart. It went on to hit number one in a bunch of other countries as well. It has been reissued at least five different times and is still extremely popular as it still gets played in just about every EDM DJ set at one time or another. It's also been covered by a lot of artists most notably Marilyn Manson and Dr. Albin, along with a Steve Angelo remix that did pretty well on the dance charts. The song got so red hot that their record label re-released Love is a Stranger to capitalize on Sweet Dreams' success, and that song ended up turning into a big hit. Throughout the 1980s, the duo put out hit after hit, songs like Here Comes the Rain Again, Sex Crime, Would I Lie to You, Missionary Man, I Need a Man, Love is a Stranger, and Annie's duet with Aretha Franklin, Sisters Are Doing It for Themselves. To go along with Tough Dance, Right by Your Side, and There Must Be an Angel, just to name a few of their songs. Then, the Eurythmics took some time apart. Annie started a successful solo career that garnered her some major awards, including a couple solo Grammy awards in her own right. Dave, meanwhile, began a successful producing career, which is still going on, having worked recently with the group Churches. Over the past decade or so, Annie and Dave have gotten together on and off as the Eurythmics, working on new music and going on tour. They were nominated twice for induction into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame before they finally got inducted in 2022. The Eurythmics 1983 breakthrough hit Sweet Dreams Are Made of This, from the album of the same name, inducted into the United States Library of Congress National Recording Registry in 2023. And we have put that song, along with the Eurythmics' greatest hits, also on to this week's music podcast playlist to go with the Smashing Pumpkins and the Reverend Al Green. And like I've said twice already, that link is in the show notes. 
The Music Halls of Fame podcast is part of the Music History Today network, which can be found under Music History Today on Spotify, Apple Music, Amazon Music, iHeartRadio, or wherever you get your podcast from, and also on our YouTube page under Music History Today. Thank you very much for listening. <laughs>